morning. Good morning. Thank you. We're, uh, we're very happy to be here in New York. We got some great stuff to share with you this morning. So let's get started. The first thing I'd like to talk about is our new Apple retail stores. We've got, as you may know, in the middle of May, we opened two Apple retail stores. One at Tyson's Corner in McLean, Virginia. That is the number one mall for the Washington, D.C. area, one of the top 10 malls in the entire country. And second, in Glendale Galleria, that is a major mall in L.A., in the Valley. And they've been open for only eight weeks now. And uh, thanks to a lot of you who visited there, the results have been terrific, just terrific. And we are now able to offer some of our customers a different way to buy their computers, a solutions-oriented way to buy their computers. We're opening four more stores in August, one in Willow Bend, a great new development in Dallas, Texas, carefully avoiding Austin and Houston. <laughs> uh, one in the Mall of America, the largest mall in the world in Minneapolis, Minnesota. One in Woodfield Mall in uh, Chicago, Illinois, just right outside of Chicago. And one in North Shore Mall in Boston, Massachusetts. So, these four stores will open in August and take us to six stores on our way to get to 25 stores open by the end of this year. Now, we had a worldwide developers conference in May. And what we did was we made a video of the store to show them so that they could see where a lot of their software would be sold. And we also stayed up all night uh, after the opening to edit together a video of our Glendale store opening. And I would like to share with you those videos now if you'd like to see them. You want to see them? Yeah? All right. Well, let's go ahead and run the video of the stores. Hi, I'm Steve Jobs, and I'm here at Tyson's Corner Mall in Virginia, right outside of Washington, D.C. And I'm standing in front of this wood barricade we built in front of our first retail store that's going to open in six days. Now nobody's seen inside here yet and I'd like to take you inside for a secret little private tour so come on in. Now this is our store and the store is divided into four parts. The first quarter of the store has our home section with great home and education products and our pro section with all our great pro products. Every product we make is in this first 25% of the store. You can see the whole product line. So come on over here, let me show you what we got going in the home section. Here's our newest iBook. We've got iBooks on display. Most of the products are running self-running demos, but you can just walk up to them and start using them for anything you like. We've got our new PowerBook G4 Titaniums running here. Again, all running Mac OS X, all on airport, so you can just pick these up and see what it's really like to have wireless connection to the internet. Literally half the store is devoted to solutions because people don't just want to buy personal computers anymore. They want to know what they can do with them. The solutions we've chosen to feature now are music, movies, photos, and kids. You can bring your kids into our store and they can just sit a spell, play their favorite games, and we have the best selection of Mac education software that I've ever seen, and you can buy the best educational titles for your kids. We decided carrying our own products wasn't enough. So we're carrying six digital camcorders, six digital cameras, six MP3 players, and six handheld organizers. So you can come in here and not only can you buy these digital devices, but you can actually hook them right up to the max and, and take them for a spin. Wouldn't it be great if when you went to buy a computer, or after you bought a computer, 
If you had any questions, you could ask a genius. Well, that's what we've got. This is called the Genius Bar. I'm not a genius, but I'll stand behind here. There'll be somebody here who can do service right in the store and who can answer any questions you've got about your Mac or about any of the peripherals or software that work with you. And if that person doesn't know the answer, they got a hotline to call us in Cupertino at Apple headquarters where we have somebody who does. But maybe the most exciting part of the back of the store is our theater. We've got an exceptional rear projection screen. We can play our latest commercials back here. We can play some incredible videos back here. And of course, we can uh, play, you know, iTunes uh, visualizations back here. One last thing I want to show you is all our great software. Look at this stuff. We have over 300 titles from games to the most sophisticated pro applications. There's something for everybody. We can't wait to feature your software right here in every single one of our stores. So, go write some more for us, and uh, we'll build more shelves for as much as you can write. Take care. so I can get in there and play with the toys for as long as I can. We flew down from Seattle. Yeah, we wouldn't have missed this for the world. Hey, I'm, I'm from, from Austria. Italy. I'm from Italy. I'm from Kansas. I teach at a middle school. We have a lot of Macs at school. And people keep saying, where do you get software for it? Or, what else is there for the Mac? Okay, I got my iMac, now what? It's great to be able to come to one place, talk to people that know what they're talking about, and find a whole lot of software. I got, you don't know Jack? Well, what I got here was this iBook, 128 megabytes of RAM, DVD. It's all ready for me and my camera. I bought a uh, Escape from Monkey Island software package. We got the Power Mac G4 Tower, uh, the flat screen display. We got the scanner and the laser jet printer. We spent a lot of money. <laughs> no, we didn't. We got the t-shirts for free. Well, I've got a copy of uh, OS X today. My message to developers is to start making more apps, get the stuff out on the shelf so that we can go pick it up. Well, for mom and dad, the most important thing is Quicken, the latest and greatest, because tax time is so much fun. I think if people knew what the Mac could do, they would own a Macintosh.
I knew we would have a crowd. I was an optimist. I knew we'd see a ton of people come in. I just didn't expect to uh, see the line go all the way through the mall, out, cross the bridge, into the parking lot, and people wait for three hours to get in. Yes, I'll be here tomorrow. I'll be here all day again tomorrow, and I can't wait. So, we're really, really excited about our Apple retail stores, and I think they're a great complement to the other great retailers that we have out there selling our products. So that's an update on Apple retail. Look forward to giving you more as the year progresses, we open more stores. Next, I'd like to talk about Mac OS X. How many of you out there, how many of you out there are using Mac OS X? Raise your hands. All right. Good. So, we introduced Mac OS X on March 24th of this year. That is only 116 days ago. And at that time, we said we thought it would take us about a year to make that transition. Now, one way I think about that is since there's 12 months in a year, and there's 12 uh, 12 <laughs> there are 12 hours on a clock face, I tend to think of it like a clock face. And since we're about four months into it, we're about at four o'clock right now in our transition on Mac OS X. So how are we doing at four o'clock? We're doing pretty well. We've got over a thousand native Mac OS X apps shipping today. And there's a lot more coming. How do we know this? Well, we talked to the developers. As a matter of fact, at our developer conference in May, we did a survey of our worldwide developers. And here's what we found. 29% of them said they plan to release a Mac OS X product within three months. That's three months of two months ago. And 55% of them said they plan to release a Mac OS X product within six months. Right? That's in the next four months. So we're really pleased with these results. Now, I've got a surprise for you. There's a lot of great software coming for Mac OS X in the next several months. And we asked 10 of the most exciting developers to show their apps here today. We've got 10 great apps running on Mac OS X that are coming soon to show you today. 10 on 10. So let's get started. The first of those is Microsoft with Office. And I'd like to invite Kevin Brown, the general manager of Microsoft's Mac business unit up to show us Microsoft Office running on Mac OS X. Kevin? Well, thank you very much, Steve. Hello, New York. Well, this past March, Mac OS X burst onto the scene with a series of great promises. This really eye-catching new interface, this rock-solid foundation, these, this set of features that would allow applications to do things they've never done before. Well, now it's our turn. The ap application developers have to take advantage of these features and deliver on those things. We set out last September to begin bringing Office to OS X, and we said the number one thing we had to do was to make an application that you could hold up and say, this is what an OS X app could do. One of the early decisions we made was, this product will run only on OS X. We wanted to make no trade-offs in our OS X support. So you'll be able to say when we ship, OS X promises it and Office X delivers it. So let me introduce you to, OS X, or to Office X on OS X. As you can see, this is a very different look for Word than we've ever had before. It's, much, it's a much warmer version of Word. You can see it is a native application with those translucent menus. We've brought forward things that you love about the current version of Word. Um, we redesigned 700 toolbar buttons with, with smooth graphics so that the, uh, the, the application looks and feels like it really belongs on this system. We uh, poured over lovingly 800 plus dialog boxes throughout Office to make sure each one is the very picture of the impl implementation of the Aqua spec. As you can see, there are these native controls. There's fast, responsive uh, feel that you should get from an OS X application. But Aqua is about much more than just beauty. 
uh, it, helps to, it helps make the applications more discoverable. For instance, uh, by show of hands, how many people actually knew that you could split the screen in Word to be working in two different places in a Word doc at the same time? About 11 in the crowd, I think. So with Aqua, we can make that a much more discoverable function. One of the things people really like about Office 2001 is the formatting palette. And so we've added that for Office 10, and it's, it's much, much improved. You can see that it's photorealistic. We had a lot of fun adding animation so that it's more discoverable how you turn it on and turn it off. The great thing about the formatting palette is it puts the tools that you need right at your fingertips so you don't even need to go see the great work that we've done inside the dialog boxes. So that's, that's a little bit about Word. We've done the same, we paid the same great attention to detail in each of our applications. Here's Excel. Uh, Excel 10 is, I think, the best looking version of Excel we've ever shipped on any platform. Notice the photorealistic look of the tabs, the nice clean interface on the spreadsheet frame. One of the great things about Aqua is that we could make it much more discoverable where you're actually typing. Believe me, this is actually a problem among Excel users. You can actually lose your place. But with these soft shadows, you'll never do so in, in Excel 10. So there's, there's Aqua, but there's so much more to OS 10 than just Aqua. We know you, as Mac users, chose this platform because you want to create the most graphically rich, stunning documents you possibly can. So we combined Office's tools with the power of OS X to enable you to do things you've never been able to do before in Office. You can actually see through that picture right to your data beyond. So, so that's, that's just some of the things that you can do. One of the big promises that OS X makes is this reliability and stability and multitasking. The OS will, will deliver the ability for you to, uh, to multitask between applications. But properly done, applications like Office are going to enable you to multitask within the applications. So I go to save this document and um, notice something else on the file list that I meant to do. So I can bring up another document, and here I can continue working in my document even while the panel is up on the other document. So the, your work is never blocked in OS X or in Office for OS X. So I mentioned that we can do all of these great things with graphically rich documents. Let's actually take a look at a little bit of that um, by opening the, uh, the drawing toolbar. Office contains over 150 auto shapes. These are just, just easily drawn common symbols that you use in your documents. Um, you can do this in Office 2001, but the results are, are so much better in Office 10. You, you see that we can apply these transparencies to, to give you the power to make documents the likes of which you've never been able to create in Office ever before. You know, I wonder if you could do that in charts. Tell you what, come to my feature presentation tomorrow morning and I'll show you all about Office 10 and the raft of other great things for, that we're doing for Mac OS 10. I hope we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Next up is Adobe. And I'm pleased to welcome Shantanu Narayan. Executive Vice President of Worldwide Products and Marketing from Adobe. Welcome, Shantanu. Thanks, Thanks, Steve. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. It's actually my son's birthday today, and he was very excited about my going to New York, which is always a mixed blessing. But that's because he knew I'd have first-hand information about all the new goodies that would be available soon for him. At Adobe, we believe that we are at the start of a third generation in publishing. We, along with Apple, helped create desktop publishing. The 90s saw web publishing. And there's a new era that Adobe, along with its partners, is labeling network publishing. Network publishing is characterized by the need to be able to access information anytime, anywhere, on any device. And our mission is to help you express your creativity with the help of Apple, so that you can have visually rich, impactful communication across print, web, video, and wireless. We're very excited about OS X, and we believe that it's a tremendous opportunity for our joint customers to be able to build and expand their business. We're extremely hard at work, all the product teams, in trying to bring the next versions of all our major applications on OS X. And these aren't just ports. Every one of them will take advantage of the new features available in OS X. And we're very excited about the performance improvements we've seen, as well as the opportunities accorded to us by the gorgeous Aqua interface.
To illustrate our commitment to OS X, I'd now like to ask Ted Alchbach to do a demo of three of our major applications on OS X. Ted? Thanks, John. Yeah. Well, what I'm showing here on screen for the first time is the version we have of Illustrator under development for OS X. Um, it looks just absolutely gorgeous with the Aqua interface. Um, we've taken full advantage of everything OS X has to offer. Um, we focus not just on new features, but also on performance enhancements. In fact, Illustrator now launches twice as fast as it did under OS 9. Uh, what you're seeing on screen right now, uh, yeah, that's, that's fantastic by itself. Um, <laughs> What you're seeing on screen right now is an artist's rendition of Botticelli's Venus. Of course, Botticelli, were he alive today, would be using a Mac and OS X and the latest version of Illustrator uh, to create Venus. And what's amazing about this, this was done entirely inside Illustrator. So these are all vector objects you can manipulate and change, but even Venus is surprised that she was created entirely inside Illustrator. Uh, I'm going to show you one of the new features that we have planned for this upcoming version of Illustrator. And that's the ability to um, slice anything you've created inside Illustrator into slices for the web, actually optimize them. So I'm going to go ahead here, selected that logo. I'll choose Slice and Make. And the logo then is sliced into various pieces automatically. What's really nice is that inside Illustrator, you can then set each of those slices to be their own optimization directly inside Illustrator. You don't necessarily have to export at that time, but you can set those slices. You can even set slices not just to GIF and JPEG, but also to SWF and SVG right inside Illustrator. I'm going to save this file, and this file is being saved into the hard drive. I'm then going to pop into our web authoring application, GoLive. And in GoLive, I have a smart object selected here. I'm going to link to that object that I just created. So I've just linked to the Illustrator file. Again, I didn't export it as a raster image. It's actually the native Illustrator image that GoLive is importing. GoLive then gives you the opportunity to further modify those slices in any way that you'd like to. Or you can go ahead and just let it, let it the way it is. It brings it into GoLive. And the real nice thing about this is that if I go back here to my Illustrator document and make a change, so for instance, if I go ahead and maybe just apply a gradient to that and save the file, as soon as I go back into GoLive, that automatically gets updated. What GoLive is doing, it's looking at the original Illustrator file, the vector file. It's re-rasterizing it, resampling it, and re-optimizing it. If I want to make a change later on in GoLive, for instance, I want that word design to possibly have transparency, maybe make it a ping or something instead of the, the GIF that it's set to now. I can do that, of course, after the fact in GoLive as well. Um, GoLive, of course, also taking full advantage of OS X and its integration between um, Illustrator and InDesign and other app Adobe applications is just phenomenal. Uh, I'm also going to show you some other uh, interop interoperability between Illustrator, and this time between InDesign. And so here's the latest version of InDesign currently under development for OS X. Again, just looks absolutely stunning. Uh, we're going to take an Illustrator document, that same one that I was just using inside GoLive, and use it inside InDesign. First thing I'm going to do here is change the opacity down to about 50% in Illustrator. I'll show you the background grid there so you can see it's truly transparent. Then I will just drag that word design inside uh, my InDesign document. I'll go ahead and click yes there. And that pops up inside, design, inside InDesign. Now you'll notice that it's transparent inside InDesign as well. In fact, the transparency is live. I can drag it around. It interacts with the objects that already exist inside InDesign. So I'll go ahead and put that in place. There's also a lot of other things that can be done in, inside InDesign as far as transparency. Uh, for instance, with that uh, same image I brought in from Illustrator, I can actually change the transparency. Here, I'll set the mode to multiply to make it look a little bit better there. I can also add some other great new effects inside InDesign, such as drop shadows. Here, I'm at applying a drop shadow to an Illustrator object. And I can even apply drop shadows to live text. So I have a live text block right, right here. And drop shadow has been applied to the text. And the drop shadow is actually sticking to the text. It's a transparent drop shadow. These are the sort of innovative features you come to expect from Adobe. And we're really excited to be able to supply these with the new versions of Adobe applications coming out for OS X. And not only does this stuff look great on screen, but we've been working with service uh, providers around the world to ensure that everything you're seeing on screen is going to print and look just as beautiful there as well. So. So be sure to you know, keep your eye out for all these great Adobe applications and more coming soon to OS X. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Quark.
I'm pleased to welcome Brett Mueller, Senior Product Manager from Quark, who's going to show us something really cool running. Welcome, Brett. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, and thank you for joining us. Uh, we have some really exciting stuff to show you today. Uh, we actually have a future version of Express that we would like to show you that we have actually not shown publicly. So you're going to see it for the first time here. Um, and it is kind of exciting. This is going to be a future version. This is a 5.x. It's running on the 5.0 code base, and our 5.0 product is getting ready for release. Uh, it's getting ready for beta right now. So let's go ahead and dig right in. Um, driving our demo today is Mike Garcia, one of our OS X engineers. And uh, what we have here is the cover from Macworld. Now every month, Macworld and thousands of other titles are published in over 184 languages using Express. Uh, a lot of professional publishers rely heavily in their print workflows on Express. And it's very exciting. We'd like to show you a couple specific features here. As we look at this cover, we can go ahead and manipulate layers now. Our customers have been asking for layer control, so you can go ahead and suppress layers, combine layers. It gives you a great tool to go ahead and use for both print and the web. The issue is print publishing has been paying a lot of the multimedia or media independent publishing drive. It's been paying the way for the web. And so we've got to give those print users a way to go to the web easily. And we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. Uh, if we look down at the bottom here, we have, uh, by the way, this is the issue that's out in the stands out there. There's a really good article here on printers. And you can see that there's a table up here in the right hand uh, page. Well, for years people have been asking, well, what about tables? Well, now we can give you tables. Right in Express, you can build tables, and not just statistical tables with text and, numer and, and numerical data. You can go ahead and use this as a design element. So if we switch, let's say, between layers, our art director can see different layouts right there. For instance, he can go ahead and combine those cells. Mike's going to go ahead and grab that. We can select cells, combine them, turn them into text or picture cells. This gives us a great design tool. Let's go ahead. We have new context menus that come up here. Go ahead. We can go ahead and actually create uh, just about anything you can do artistically in Express with colors and dashed lines, etc. You can now do in a table cell, and you can use all your paragraph and character style sheets. Now, this gives us some really powerful tools. Uh, but what about going to the web? Okay, uh, with over six, excuse me, 700 active developers and 1,300 extensions out there, you can do just about anything you want with Express. But natively inside Express, I'm very pleased to show you now for the very first time building web pages right in Express using the tools you know and now showing it on OS X. Very exciting. Mike is opening up what is really going to be a web page. Now we could go ahead and populate this, uh, put content in through XML with the XML tools that are available in Express, or we can just drag and drop it across. Print to web. How long will it take print designers to learn this? Well, Mike's an engineer, he's doing it. So, <laughs> yes, it's not just for breakfast anymore. So, uh, so Mike goes ahead and pulls us across. Now what we're going to do here in just a second, we're going to click one button, it's going to collect all of the style sheet data, it's going to port it to HTML with all our cascading style sheets, and it'll take all of our print-ready images, it might be TIFFs or EPSs, convert those on the fly to JPEGs or PNGs or GIFs, your choice, and it'll do it without Photoshop or any other third-party application. We're going to create valid HTML. So let's go ahead and do it. One button click. It's going to launch the browser. I think we're using Internet Explorer, which is native on OS X. Comes up. There's our web page. It's that fast. It is that easy to go from print to web. The exciting thing about this is, this is really what media independent publishing is supposed to be about. You go from your current content that's making a lot of money to new media that you're going to hope is going to be making money out there to then other media. Now there's a whole lot more to show you, but we don't have a whole lot of time. So we look forward to talking to you. Thank you so much. Have a great show. Thank you. Next up, wrong screen. Next up, we got FileMaker, an amazing application, which is really a platform that thousands or probably tens of thousands of applications run on. And it's my pleasure to bring up Dominique Goupil, president of FileMaker, to show us FileMaker running on Mac OS X. Welcome, Dominique. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. 
Two months ago, we started shipping Famicure Pro 5.5, one of the first major commercial applications for OS X. And today we are pleased to report that we have already shipped 50,000 copies of Famicure Pro 5.5 for Mac OS X, and that's just in North America. Globally, we have several million customers. Therefore, having FileMaker available for Mac OS X means that literally millions of existing applications are automatically compatible with OS X. Every, every FileMaker solution you now run on OS 9 will run on OS X. Every FileMaker solution you run on any platform will now run better on OS X. And now what you're seeing on screen um, is our second product uh, for Mac OS X, FileMaker Server 5.5 we should provide better performance, reliability, and security thanks to the power of Mac OS X. One of the things you will do with a server, of course, is scheduling backups. You can see the, uh, the very nice interface, um, and also the window pane feature, which we got by using Cocoa technology. Uh, Famicom Server 5.5 will start shipping on July 30, and it will be our first product leveraging Cocoa technology. What I'd like to show you now um, is not a product demonstration, but rather two real-world examples of what our customers can do using FileMaker and OS X. At Showtime Networks, uh, right here in New York, uh, they create every year thousands of on-air promos for upcoming shows and specials. So how do they keep track uh, of when to show those promos? Well, they use FileMaker Pro, and this powerful application uh, was built by David Preisman and Jimmy Wilson, who are actually not database designers by trade, but are actually video editors and producers. But the combination of FileMaker and Macintosh allows them to create very effective advertising. Um, and if you're a boxing fan, you've probably already seen that clip on, uh, on Showtime. So let's now uh, turn to the fashion industry. Uh, FileMaker Pro has been used for years by QRS as an electronic fashion catalog, which they developed for customers like Donna Karen, Calvin Klein, Ralph Lauren, Versace, and others here in New York. Uh, note the ease with which you can create what are called lookbook layouts so that you can show uh, this season fashion line. You know, the flexibility of FileMaker allows the user to do decidedly non-database things. It's a very powerful application. It can cost up to hundreds of thousands of dollars, and it's built on FileMaker, and it's running here on OS X. What better platform is there indeed than a Macintosh if you're going to work with images? And if you use FileMaker to organize the information, you can actually navigate very easily to the relevant data. Uh, and using QuickTime VR, you can see that fashions really come alive. So here you have it, powerful real-world solutions using OS X and FileMaker. And the last thing I'd like to mention is that at FileMaker, our intent is not to ship one or two products from Mac OS X. But to make sure by that, that by this fall, FileMaker will be one of the very first major software companies to have 100% of its products native for Mac OS X. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Now, what happens if you have an app you really want to run but it's not going to run on Mac OS X? Well, there's a way to run it coming soon from Connectix. My pleasure to introduce Kurt Schmucker, who is the Vice President of Product Management from Connectix, to show us virtual PC running on Mac OS X. Welcome. Good morning, Steve. As Steve mentioned, there are times when a Mac user needs to run a piece of software which, for one reason or another, is not available on the Mac. That's where virtual PC comes in. Virtual PC lets a Mac user run any Windows-based application right on their Mac screen. Now at Connectix, we know that lots of our users are moving to Mac OS X. So I'm happy to announce that, we're, that a technology preview of Virtual PC for Mac OS X is available today. This technology preview, which we call the VPC Test Drive for Mac OS X, is a free download for any registered user of VPC 4.0. Let me show you the test drive. You can see here in this VPC window the, the OSs that we have loaded on this demo machine. And they include Windows 2000, Windows 95, Windows 98, Windows Millennium, Windows NT, and even the new Windows XP, which isn't even going to ship until the fall. These OSs are all on this machine, ready to launch in just a few seconds. So let's launch one of them. 
Let's launch Windows 98. When you launch an OS in Virtual PC, it's like waking up a power book. It just takes a few seconds to have it available to you. And any of those OSs that have that characteristic. You can load as many of those OSs on your machine as you have disk space for, and you can run as many simultaneously as you have RAM for. Now you can see in this big blue window, inside that window is, is Windows 98. But outside that window, Mac OS X is still running. When you move the cursor back and forth across the edge of that window, you see it change from a Mac cursor to a Windows cursor. Now, of course, the thing that's really important and what you care about are the new applications you can run, the applications that wouldn't otherwise be available to a Mac user. I have lots of applications loaded into this copy of Windows 98, including the new Office XP suite, which isn't available for the Mac yet. But the application I'd like to show you today is AutoCAD. AutoCAD is an engineering application. It allows people to design complex three-dimensional blueprints of objects prior to their manufacture. And what we're loading here today is a blueprint of a car. And this is a car that you can see being drawn as each of the lines and curves that, that designs this car are brought into, into the, the system. A car is a relatively complex object. So to get, when you get all these lines and everything in there, it's hard for you to see what's going on. So AutoCAD includes a way to render the car to see it as it will be when the car is finally done. And you can see that here. So what you've just seen is AutoCAD, an application that's not available for the Mac, running on the Mac in the VPC test drive for Mac OS X. So visit our website to download your copy of the VPC test drive and come by the Connectix booth to learn even more about virtual PC. Thank you very much. Next up is IBM with something truly remarkable that I think you're going to like. I'd like to introduce Toby Manners, the segment manager of IBM's voice and pen systems. Toby, welcome to Macworld. Thank you very much. Two years ago, Ozzy Osbourne of IBM's voice systems stood up here and introduced to you the very first version of IBM's Via Voice for the Macintosh platform. That was Via Voice Millennium Edition. It was IBM's first continuous speech dictation application. A year later, we followed it up with Via Voice for the Mac Millennium Edition. Uh, sorry, Enhanced Edition. We are here today to show you a preview of our latest Via Voice for Mac OS X. Some of the new features that you'll notice are a, an Aqua user interface completely redesigned for OS X. We have customizable command and control of your desktop and your applications. We have dictation into practically any text field and text-based application. And the engine has been optimized for running on the G4 processor and on multiprocessors. Jeff Kuznets of IBM's Almaden Research Laboratory is here and will show you a demonstration and a preview. Jeff, why don't you show some of the new features? Thank you. OK. Open mail. Next message. Open video clip. We are Double size. To Double size. Their voice speech Pause playback. Switch to mail. Reply to message. Set speech mode to dictation. David, comma, new paragraph. Thank you for the video clip, period. I can't believe it has been two years since we announced the first version of Via Voice for Macintosh, comma. Can you, question mark? It seems like only yesterday, period. New paragraph. I have just started using the newest version, comma, built specifically for Mac OS X, period. It is spectacular, exclamation point. You need to try it as soon as you get back to the office, period. New paragraph, letter closing. Set speech mode to command. Save as draft. Close window. Quit this. Resume playback.
Thank you all very much. Via Voice for the Mac OS X will be available later this year. We're in booth 749. Come by any time this week and you can see an enhanced longer demonstration. We'd be more than happy to show it to you. Thanks very much. Next is a product that I think every home user and many of our education users are going to love. It's from World Book. It's my pleasure to introduce Michael Ross, the publisher of World Book, to show us just an amazing new product from Mac OS X. Welcome. Thanks, Steve. Good morning. We're absolutely thrilled to debut for you the 2002 World Book on Mac OS X. From the moment that the application opens, you realize that this is not your ordinary encyclopedia. From the home page, you get a rich display of multimedia experiences that are absolutely designed for exploration. The music that you hear is pulled from the World Book database randomly, and you can choose among classical, jazz, or international segments. The visuals in the bottom of the page are also pulled from the thousands and thousands of World Book videos, animations, 3D views, randomly. But they're not just for decoration. Click on any image and you're immediately launched to the World Book Media Center, where you can learn more about that particular image or other images that are related to it, or open the article to that image and find out more information. That article and the articles in general are the heart of the World Book database. There are over 25,000 multimedia rich articles on this Mac OS X product. And you can search all of these articles. So since we're in New York, we go ahead and look up New York and you can see the outline displayed, you can see the article displayed, and all the tools that you need to explore the information, including related information on the CD-ROM and information that you can pull in over, over the internet that are all web-approved uh, websites by World Book editors. You can also explore the timeline feature and get a history of New York. Or if you like, click on the animation canister and get a preview of all the images that are available in that article. You can click on any one of them. If you click on the map to New York, for example, you're immediately launched into the wonderful World Book Atlas with that aquatic look in the water that just shimmers. From there, you can search any location on the Earth, including the Jacob Javits Center, and it'll take you right to the Javits Center. Or if you prefer, you can find two of your favorite destinations on Earth and find the relative distances between them on the wonderful distance calculator. World Book is a wonderful tool for getting information, but it's also a wonderful tool for exploring knowledge. If you're a student and you want to look up a topic and you don't know what to do, you can put in a date or an era, in this case the Civil War, click on the Civil War and hundreds of images come before you to, to whet your appetite and look something up and do your report. Or if you want a different kind of search, you can go to Surf the Millennium, where we have divided the last thousand years into virtual websites. Yes, on World Book 2002 for Mac OS 2, even Joan of Arc gets her website. But don't try this on Windows, and it won't work on Mac OS 9, because this World Book is available only on Mac OS 10. It's available right now. You can see it at our booth for $59.95. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. That's incredible, isn't it? That's incredible. Next, let's go to some games. Blizzard Entertainment. It's my pleasure to welcome Fra Frank Pierce, the co-founder and vice president of Blizzard Up, to show us a hot new game running on Mac OS X. Frank, welcome. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. It's great to be here today. We're really excited about OS X. Mac gamers have always been a priority to us. Every game we've published has been available on the Mac. We even have an in-house... We have an in-house development team dedicated exclusively to our Mac products. Our commitment to Mac gaming continues this winter with the upcoming release of one of the most anticipated games of all time, Warcraft 3.
Our goal is a simultaneous worldwide release of Warcraft 3 on both the Mac and the PC. In a moment here, Scott is demonstrating the latest build of Warcraft 3. This is the first Blizzard game to use real-time 3D graphics. This version is carbonized, so it runs fast, and as you can see, it looks great on OS X. Warcraft 3 is a real-time strategy game that we're taking to the next level. There will be four playable races, and we're incorporating role-playing elements by giving you legendary heroes. Your heroes will have inventory and gain experience and abilities through the course of the game. And, as Scott will show you, Warcraft 3 will feature plenty of carnage. <laughs> Warcraft 3 will be playable on Battle.net, our free online gaming service. Battle.net features will include automated tournaments, anonymous matchmaking, and competitive ladders with players from around the world. The Warcraft 3 multiplayer gaming experience is going to kick ass. Mac gaming has never been as exciting as it is today, and we look forward to supporting Mac gamers for years to come. Thanks for your time today, and we'll see you on Battle.net soon. Thanks again, Steve. <laughs> Warcraft 3, a uh, simulation of the uh, Microsoft AOL competition next year. <laughs> okay. Next, Aspire. It's my pleasure to welcome Mike Rogers, the president of Aspire, to show us something really wonderful running on Mac OS X. Welcome. Hi, Steve. Thank you. At Aspire, we're motivated by one thing, bringing the best gaming experience to the best platform on the planet. In 98, we brought you Tomb Raider. In 99, Madden Football. Last year was The Sims. And this year, we're going to be showing off a little bit of Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2. It's an absolute thrill bringing this game to OS X. The power and stability of the 10 platform has elevated gaming to a whole new level. It means faster load times, advanced virtual memory, so the system adapts to the game on the fly, and with the power and speed of a highly integrated system, every game I've seen just looks and plays better under 10. Now Brandon here is going to show us some six moves, six moves in the game, and hopefully he won't spill too much. Backstage he told me he could clear this level before I was done talking, so we'll see how he does. The game puts you in control of one of 13 of Skateboarder's Elite. Brandon here is playing as Tony, but each one of the skaters has their own special moves. And you can even customize your skater to put yourself in the game. There's all kinds of different levels, from indoor to outdoor, even competitions. And a custom skate park editor, so you can create your own skate park and share them with your friends. It's even got multiplayer support. You can play with your friends over a network or over the internet, which is a Mac-only feature of the game. Go for it, Brandon. <laughs> All right. So if you've ever wanted to try a fakey 5 manual judo kickflip combo, almost, <laughs> then this is your dream game come true. It's incredibly fun, incredibly addictive, easy to play, and it's got all the fun of the real world without any of the breaks and bruises. So, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 is available now at our booth for OS 9 and OS 10. It ships with OS 10 version right in the box. We also have a bunch of other games that are OS 10 ready on display at our booth. So give it a try, come on by. We think you'll see why we think OS 10 and games are an incredible combination. Good job, Brandon. Thanks a lot to Apple and everybody at Activision and Westlake that helped us bring the game out. Thank you, Steve. That's great. And it won't be the last we hear about Tony Hawk today. 
Okay, last but not least, Alias Wavefront and Maya. It is my pleasure to introduce a friend, and the former director of Maya Technologies, Richard Karras. Welcome. Thank you very much, Tim. You know, these days, 3D computer graphics are everywhere. We see it in some of these amazing video games. We see it in some groundbreaking feature films. We're seeing 3D illustration in magazines and virtual worlds appearing on the web. 3D is a medium being used to communicate, present, and of course, entertain. And Apple has been building Mac OS X to be the best platform for 3D. And they've been doing this because they've been working with developers as they build OS X. Developers like Alias Wavefront, who have helped make sure that the absolute best 3D technology is available at the very core of the operating system. And because Apple provides both the hardware and the software, they can fine tune it better than anybody. And Maya shows this off very well. Maya is the most incredible technology available for 3D graphics, with an extensive set of tools ranging from modeling, animation, to very unique special effects. Maya is the tool of choice for the high-end 3D professional. Now with me here today is Dan Pressman, product specialist from Alias Wavefront. He's going to show us some of the amazing things you can do with Maya on Mac OS X. Dan? Thanks a lot, Richard. First thing I'd like to do is to show you a quick time movie that I've rendered out of Maya here. Let's go ahead and play that for you. So you can see the great rendering quality we have there. Now I'm just going to jump into Maya, and you can see that I have one of those robots loaded in. And let's just take a look at some of the stuff that was involved in setting that motion up. So the first thing I want to do is just select the robot, and I'm just going to set some keyframes for the robot animating along the conveyor belt. So I'm just going to sort of grab that whole assembly and slide it forward, and you can see the motion I've set up. So really basic right now, but because of Maya's advanced dynamic system, I can easily go in and rig this guy to be fully dynamic. So what's going to happen here is the legs are going to move, and you can see the entire upper body behaves realistically, being calculated by our Dynamics engine. So this is being calculated on the fly here. And as you saw in the final, what we can do is animate this guy falling apart. So to do that, I can basically select all the hinges that are holding his body together, play him forward until a frame where I want him to fall apart, like so, and then just keyframe these hinges turning off over the course of one frame. So if I play this back now, you can see that he moves forward until he gets to that frame, and he kind of falls to pieces under the conveyor belt. Now, of course, in Maya, we can just grab those keyframes very easily and move them forward in time to another point. And if I rewind this and play it back, you can see we get a completely different outcome from the robot. So he kind of swings back and falls backwards. Now, we're fully integrated, so you can bring in particles as well. I've done that here. Let's play this again. You can see the particles, I've set them up to understand when the robot falls apart, start to emit some fire and smoke. And I've actually gone ahead and rendered out a few different variations on this. So we can render straight out to QuickTime, and I've done that with these. So let's just take a look at some of these here. Here's another one. Now, of course, you can take all these variations, render them out, drag and drop them into iDVD or DVD Studio Pro, and very quickly create a DVD to present to a client. So I hope this gives you an idea of what you can do with Maya and Mac OS X. Isn't that incredible? And today is the official launch of this product. Alias Wavefront is taking orders starting today at their booth. And uh, Apple's been building the best platform for 3D. So from all of us in the 3D community, thank you, Apple. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. So I know it was a lot to sit through, but I wanted to show you these 10 remarkable apps. They are 10 of the next 1,000 apps coming to Mac OS X that we're going to see in the coming months. So I thank you for letting me share with you these 10 on 10.
Now, this is a peek at what some of our developers are doing. What's Apple doing? Well, we've been doing a lot. We've had four updates to Mac OS X so far in the first four months. And the software update mechanism in Mac OS X is working beautifully. And it's very popular. As an example, the last update we had, 10.0.4, we had over 300,000 downloads up. So there's a lot of people out there using Mac OS X on a daily basis. But today I'm pleased to announce the first major upgrade of Mac OS X that will be coming. 10.1. Our, our great software team worked real hard to get the first release out, but we didn't let them stop. They've been working overtime to get this new release out, and uh, I think you'll like it. We focused on a few things. The first one is performance. Performance, performance, performance. We have much faster menus, much faster window resizing, blazing application launch, faster login, faster graphics, you name it, it's faster. Spent a lot of time on performance. The second thing is enhancing Aqua based on a lot of requests. Number one, movable dock. Number two, I think you're going to like a lot, I'll show you in a minute, system menus. A dramatically improved finder and a lot more personalization in the system. As far as supporting our digital hub, we now have iTunes bundled in, we have DVD playback, we have, we have CD burning not only from iTunes for audio CDs but from the finder for data CDs, and we have dramatically enhanced support for digital cameras built in. On the printing side, we are now supporting over 200 PostScript printers with all the DLLs or whatever they are bundled in, LaserWriter 8 features, and much better plug and play for USB printing. And on the networking side, AFP servers over Apple Talk, a big request that we've had. We have a built in SMB client, which means that if you hook Mac OS X up to a Windows network, the other Windows machines and all the Windows servers will see that Mac OS X machine as just another first class Windows citizen on that network. We also have full support built in for an emerging internet standard called WebDAV, and we've moved iDisk over to run on top of WebDAV, so it's always there, it never disconnects. And you can now manage airport base stations right out of Mac OS X. So, this is just, this, these are just a few of the many thousands of improvements we've made, and what I'd like to do now is I'd like to give you a sneak peek at Mac OS 10.1, if I could. All right. So, the first thing I'd like to do is just show you a little bit about the performance. So let's go up to menus. You'll see that menus are really fast now. Okay? So that's nice. Uh, one of the other things that people really wanted us to speed up was application launch. So I'm going to launch a photograph. I'm going to open a photo here, which is going to cause a launch of preview. Boom. There it is. Open. Let me quit that. Boom. There it is. Quit that. Boom. There it is. Let me uh, open a, uh, another uh, a text document. We'll open text edit. Boom. One bounce. All these applications are opening very, very fast, launching very, very fast. Let me launch Sherlock. Less than a bounce. Let me uh, launch Mail. About a bounce. Okay. Now, these are our apps that we ship with Mac OS X. What about third-party apps? Well, Internet Explorer is a great poster child because it used to take over five bounces to launch IE. Let's take a look at it right now. One bounce. Okay. Let me close all these. I'll just, uh, I got a little folder here. Let me select all these apps and just launch them. So, all right, let me put all these guys. So, that gives you a, a, a sense of how fast things are launching now 
in 10.1. So I want to show you one other thing. Uh, let me open three photos again. Now I want to show you something new we've added. You know of the genie effect we've had to miniaturize. We've added a new effect called scale. And you can pick whichever one you like. But I think we're going to ship with scale turned on. And let me show you how fast uh, miniaturization is. Yeah. You can see how fast it is. It's much faster even than the genie. And again, I'll run it in slow motion. It's a very nice effect. Right? Boom, boom, boom. So that is also much faster in 10.1. Uh, now let's go to the finder. Well, resizing. Resizing is a lot faster in Mac OS 10.1. There's icon view. Let's go to list view, which was pretty slow. All right, it's like butter now. And uh, let's go to column view again. Maybe let's get another column here. Column view, very fast as well. Now, another new feature in 10.1, watch this. Resizing the columns right there, real time. Okay. Very, very nice. Just resize all the columns right there. OK, one other thing I'd like to show you now in the menu bar, we've added these new system menus here. These are for things in your system where you want status and you don't want to take up a dock slot to do it. You can choose to put these things up here. We have connections here to modems. You can right here, take a look at what your connection status is, connect and disconnect. Speaker volume, if you want it, right here. Displays, you can switch display resolutions, even the battery. And you can show, as an example, you can show the time left on the battery, or you can even show the percent of time left on the battery. And so all these things, as well as airport, if you have an airport card plugged in, show you your signal strength, let you turn airport off and on, et cetera, all right up there in the menu where they're super convenient. So now let's do some multimedia stuff. First thing I'd like to do now is launch a DVD player. Here it is. And uh, let's go ahead and bring up a title. <clears throat> Here we go. And uh, yeah, one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, let's see. So let's go chapter selection, and I'll pick a good chapter. And let's go play this thing. No. <laughs> All right, let's try that again. All right, chapter selection. Let's go over here. Let's try playing that, and let's play full frame. One of my favorite movies. So, all right. So that is the DVD player. Uh, now let's go ahead and launch uh, iTunes. iTunes bundled in. And again, you know, we can go search for music and uh, WH, you know, Nowhere Man, let's say. You know? Now let's say it's a little too loud. We've added another nice thing. You know? Very nice. We have these on brightness and volume. All right. So iTunes bundled in to Mac OS 10.1. And, um, oh, one other thing I want to show you about iTunes, actually. Let's go ahead and uh, we have also dock menus on the apps now. We can go to the next song. Or we can pause, whatever we want to do here. So we have menus off of the applications as well as the folders now. All right, disk burning. Uh, let me go ahead and eject this disk. It's Toy Story 2 disc, and I will put in a uh, CDR disc, and uh, we will see that pop up in just a minute. And let's go ahead and start to burn a CD right from the desktop. <clears throat> Takes a few minutes to figure out what kind of disc it is. Go ahead and prepare it, and it'll show up in just a second here. And now what I can do is just drag a few things right onto that disk, should it ever pop up. There it is. So let me uh, go ahead and open it. And uh, I'll just drag some things in like this. And uh, I can just now, we have a burn button right on the toolbar if you choose to put it up there. 
And I can just pick burn. It says, do you want to burn? Yes. And I am now burning a data CD right from the desktop. So, all right. Another thing in the multimedia space is digital cameras. I've got a digital camera here with some photographs on it. Let's say I've just come back from taking these photographs. And uh, all I have to do now to make them work with OS X is to turn the camera on, which can sometimes be the most time-consuming part of this process, and plug the USB cable right into, in this case, the keyboard. And if the camera indeed turned on, Mac OS X is going to recognize the camera, which it, I guess, didn't turn on here. Let's try turning the camera on. All right. Yeah, I need some help up here. It's technical. <laughs> My camera's not turning on. What's that? I did slide it and let go. It's not turning on. Here. OK. We'll let an expert see if he can turn it on. Hopefully he can. So I want to show you, uh, got it on? Batteries have to go back in for me throwing it, sorry. All right, let me show you one last thing then. I'm going to show you the dock. So let's go get the dock preferences panel. Again, preferences launches in uh, about a bounce. So let's go get the dock preferences panel. And as you know, we can change the dock size, right? We can change magnification, turn it off and on. We can automatically hide the dock or not. And now we can put the dock on the left, the bottom, or the right. Works just the same as it did before. Boom, boom. Really, really nice. OK. Now what I'd like to do is if we get this camera running, which it's not going to run, I'm afraid. All righty. Well, that's what I have to show you on Mac OS X, some of the new features of Mac OS 10.1. So, Mac OS 10.1, it's going to be a free upgrade for existing owners of Mac OS 10. We're going to ship it in September, and if it is 4 o'clock today in our transition to Mac OS 10, when we ship 10.1, it will be 6 o'clock, halfway through the transition. Not only have we shipped four upgrades, but we will have our first major release from the initial release of Mac OS X. Halfway through the transition this September, that's what's happening on Mac OS X. All right. Now, let's get into hardware. We've got four product lines. First thing I'd like to do today is focus on our notebooks. Our notebooks are like a rocket right now. Let me first take the iBook. The iBook is an incredible product we introduced on May 1st. It is a wonderful implementation of our digital hub strategy. The new iBook can sit at the center of all your digital devices. You can make movies. You can burn CDs on it. It's wonderful. And the reviews it's gotten are phenomenal. I have a new favorite laptop, the LA Times. The iBook, richly featured and starting at $12.99, is close to ideal for students. Business week. At 4.9 pounds, with a full complement of ports, a CD or DVD drive, the new iBook is the lightest, smallest, full-featured consumer portable I've seen. Walt Mossberg, The Wall Street Journal. The iBook stealth feature is its price. The base model is $500 less than the lowest price similarly configured Windows competitor, pounding a silver spike through the heart of the notion that Macintosh elegance necessarily commands a premium price, the New York Times. And the new iBook is simply the best consumer laptop on the market today. Dell, Compaq, and the others should be ashamed they haven't come close to building a laptop this cool and at this price, ZDNet. So, we announced the new iBook on May 1st. And 
During the month of May and the month of June last quarter, we shipped 182,000 of our new iBooks. This is more notebook computers than we have ever shipped of any model in any quarter. And we did it in two months. Unfortunately, we were still not able to meet the retail demand. So we're working overtime to ship a lot more iBooks this month and this quarter. And if you've had trouble getting one, you should be able to get one real soon. So the new iBook's an exceptional product. Our second portable, PowerBook. PowerBook has won industry-wide acclaim as the best notebook computer around. It's made out of titanium. And the thing is, uh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And the reviews it's gotten are also wonderful. The PowerBook G4 is a landmark hardware achievement. The titanium laptop blew me away, the San Jose Mercury. Whether you need it or not, I guarantee you'll want one. If you've ever suffered Sony Bio Envy, this PowerBook will end it once and for all, the Houston Chronicle. If you could take just one laptop with you on a desert island, this would be the one, the Boston Globe. I think the new PowerBook G4 Titanium is the most impressive notebook computer ever, Fortune Magazine. We have never had a notebook lineup get these kinds of reviews. It is unbelievable, and uh, we really, really appreciate your response to these portables. We're making them as fast as we can. So let's go to desktops now. Start with the iMac. iMac. Today, we've got three new models of the iMac. Let's talk about it. 500, 600, and 700 megahertz iMacs, fastest iMacs we've ever shipped, 128 megabytes to 256 megabytes of memory, all plenty enough to run Mac OS X, 20, 40, and 60 hard gig drives, the largest drives we've ever shipped on an iMac, CDRW across the board, 999 on our entry iMac, 500 megahertz, 128 megabytes, CDRW. Today, availability for the 500 and the 600 megahertz, availability on the 700 next month. So again, take a look at this entry skew and see how far we've come from where we were even a year ago. 500 megahertz, 128 megabytes, a 20 gig hard drive, CDRW for under $1,000. It's amazing. It's the first time we've ever had a CDRW iMac under $1,000. Now. The 500 megahertz SKU is available in Indigo and Snow. The 6 and 700 megahertz are available in Snow and Graphite. Again, the iMac bundled with iMovie and iTunes is the best desktop computer to be a digital hub to all of your other digital devices and the best and fastest way to get on the internet. So the new iMacs, which brings us to the Power Mac G4. Power Mac G4, we introduced a new lineup of Power Macs in January. Our phrase was the power to burn. Power to burn CDs, DVDs, and Pentiums. We also introduced the SuperDrive, a landmark achievement, a drive that's capable of burning CDs, reading DVDs, and most important, burning DVDs that you can read in almost any consumer DVD player. This has been a very successful product for us, and today I am thrilled to say we have the second generation of this product to introduce to you this morning. Internally, we call it Quicksilver. This is what the Power Mac has looked like up till today. This is what Quicksilver looks like. It's a nice refinement. And Quicksilver is going to come in three models. They are all very fast. <clears throat> 733 megahertz. Yesterday, 733 megahertz was at the top of our line, the fastest chip we shipped. Starting today, it is our entry level power map. <laughs> On mid range, our mid-range is 867 megahertz, and we have a 2 megabyte L3 cache. This thing screams. And our high-end, by popular request from almost all of our pro customers, dual 800 megahertz. 
with dual 2 megabyte level 3 caches. It's going to be the ultimate machine to run Mac OS X on. This machine delivers 12 gigaflops of sustained throughput. These machines are very fast. They all have 133 megahertz system and memory bus. They all have five slots, AGP4X graphics, Firewire, three drive bays, and gigabit ethernet built in on the motherboard. And they all come in the award-winning enclosure we've come to know and love. Power Mac, where a pro customer can get at any component inside, be it memory, a drive, anything, just by opening one door. So three models. 733, 867, and dual 800. Single, single, and dual processor. Let's take a look at the configs. The 867 is the fastest chip we've ever shipped. The dual 800 is the fastest system we've ever shipped. 128 to 256 megabytes of memory. 40, 60, and 80 gigabyte drives. This is the largest hard drive we've ever shipped. And since you can fit three of them in the box, you can fit a quarter terabyte in the Power Mac box now. NVIDIA GeForce 2 graphics cards across the line, except at the top end, we have included a dual display card, which has both an Apple digital display output and a VGA output, so you can have two displays operating simultaneously with independent screens. This is the big one. CDRW at the entry. SuperDrive, not only on the high-end model, but we are bringing it down now to the mid-range. And the prices, $16.99, $24.99, $34.99. So, let's take a look at these SKUs. The entry level, it cost $3,500 yesterday to get a 733 MHz G4. It costs $16.99 today. It cost $34.99 to get a super drive yesterday. That's $1,000 less today with an incredible config with an 867 megahertz G4. And the high end is to die for if you're running Mac OS X. Dual processors, 80 gigabyte hard drive, dual display and super drive for $34.99. We're very, very pleased with these configs. Now let's talk about the SuperDrive for a minute for those of you who haven't used one yet. This is a breakthrough uh, of the first order. When we first shipped the SuperDrive early this year, we were the first people in the world to do so. And what a SuperDrive is, is we can look at the different kinds of drives here. A CD-ROM is a drive that reads CDs. A DVD drive is a drive that reads both CDs and DVDs, so that in particular you can play movies. A CDRW drive forsakes the ability to read DVDs in exchange for the ability to both read and write CDs. So we can write music CDs, we can write data CDs. Now, an interesting drive that's just come on the market that's popular, we're shipping a lot of them in our new iBook, is the combo drive, which adds back in the ability to read DVDs so you can watch movies on the road. It's called a combo drive. But there's still been one thing missing, and that's the ability to write DVDs that we can go play in consumer DVD players. And that is what the Super Drive adds back in. The Super Drive does all of these things in one drive. So we can write DVDs that we can play in consumer DVD players without giving up the ability to play movies and write CDs as well. And the Super Drive is now available in two of the three Power Mac SKUs starting at $24.99. We think a lot of people are going to be writing a lot of DVDs starting now. So, all, all of these new Power Macs, of course, are powered with the incredibly fast G4 chip. But how does this stack up against Intel's Pentium 4? We've got an 867 megahertz G4 trying to compete with a 1.7 gigahertz Pentium 4. They say they've released a 1.8, but we tried to buy one the last few weeks and we can't find one anywhere. So. My guess is they'll be out soon. So we had to settle for a 1.7 gigahertz one. How do they compare? Well, I'd like to invite Phil Schiller, our Vice President of Worldwide Product Marketing up, and let's have a showdown. 
Hi, Phil. Hey, what do we have here today? Good morning. It's my favorite part of the show. <laughs> is the part where we get to see whether our favorite computer, the super fast Power Mac, can really keep up with these amazingly high megahertz uh, Pentium 4s. You see on the screen, we have two computers here, a Power Mac G4 on the left screen, running at 867 megahertz, and an Intel Pentium 4 system at 1.7 gigahertz. Now they're both configured the same, a gigabyte of memory, same drives, same NVIDIA graphic cards, and what we want to do is put them side by side, running the latest software exactly the same in both machines with exactly the same files, and see how they do. So Steve, if you can help me up, yep. I'd like to bring up Media Cleaner. This is new Media Cleaner 5. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a very processor intensive and system intensive task that a lot of our pro customers do putting up content with QuickTime and other media applications, and some coding and decoding, and doing a lot of very powerful work. So, to begin with, if you want to give us a countdown, first we have to start up, pre-flight it by hitting play. And it's going to give us a prompt for an output file it's going to make. So for the count of three. Three, two, one, go. So now what we're doing is starting with the source QuickTime movie, we're going to deinterlace it because it's coming from an NTC video. It has to be deinterlaced. It. We're going to crop it, and we're going to encode it with the brand new Sorensen 3 uh, video codec. So a lot of high, high-end processing performance. And the machines are both going. It's a brand new movie trailer that went up on Friday on our movie trailer website up on Apple.com. It's the kind of work our, our our developers do every single day. And as you see, the Power Mac is moving ahead on the left. The Pentium 4 trying to keep up on the right. It's an appropriate uh, video clip for here because, of course, as you all know, Spider-Man is from New York. Every time you watch video on the web, somebody has done this or something very similar to this. So this is a very, very common thing that's done all the time by our customers. I know the suspense is killing you all. What is going to happen? You can see why people want this to happen as fast as possible. All right, Power Mac is just about done here. And the 1.7 gigahertz Pentium 4 looks a little under halfway done. All right, Power the Mac, Power is, Mac done. is done. <laughs> While now, we're uh, waiting, why don't you play the video? All right. Take a look at this clip we've just encoded. All right. So there are, there are thousands of people doing this right now as we're sitting here. And you can see why they want these machines to go as fast as they can. The 1.7 gigahertz Pentium looks to be a little over halfway done, so we're going to let it rest in peace here and go on to our next uh, demo. All right. Phil, what's next? All right. Well, a performance demo for our customers who use Power Max uh, wouldn't be complete uh, with the demo of Photoshop. It's one of the most used apps uh, by our Power, our Power Mac customers. It really takes full advantage of everything the system has to offer, the velocity engine, the memory bus performance, graphics, and the hard drive to do amazing things um, for amazing documents that our customers create. 
We again have a 867 megahertz G4 on the left and a 1.7 gigahertz Pentium on the right. All right, let's bring up Photoshop here. So now this is an, a document, the exact same document in both machines. And for those who have watched this before, you know that with Photoshop, not only can we move the same document cross-platform, but we can go through and script a series of actions that an artist would actually do to create a document, as the case here. Now, on every one of these demos, I always ask Phil and his team, is there any trickery going on here? Is this totally straight? Is this exactly what somebody does every day? And uh, the answer is always yes, and we police these things very, very st strictly. But I can guarantee you this one's yes, because I am familiar with what you're about to see. All right. Three, two, one, go. So we have a movie poster here that was created by an artist with actual output from some very high-end 3D software. And we're going through a 200 megabyte file that has over 100 actions that an artist would do to create this document. We're bringing in different layers. We're transforming them. We're using fills and gradients, unsharp masks and color lenses. And this really taxes all the great capabilities in Adobe Photoshop, the type of work our customers do every single day. The Mac right. is done. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking, is the, is, is the PC working? What are those 1.7 gigahertz actually doing? Um, you can see the weight cursor as it's trying to scale down this image and bring it in, something the Mac did a while ago. And again, the number one thing most people do with Photoshop is scale images. This is done by every Photoshop user many, many, many times a day. By the way, this, this poster is an answer to the question, what will you be doing on November 2nd? <laughs> Are you sure this thing's running? OK, yeah. good. All right, Pentium, 1.7 gigahertz. So, thank you, Phil. Thanks, Steve. So, in our showdown, in our showdown, we've got an 867 megahertz G4 against a 1.7 gigahertz Pentium 4. And in the showdown, whoops, sorry. In the showdown, the G4 completed the task in 45 seconds. The Pentium 4 took 82 seconds for the same exact task. That means the G4 at this task is 80% faster than a 1.7 gigahertz Pentium. Now, I know what you're thinking. How can this be? How can this be? And the answer to this question is a technical one, but the name that we've given it is the megahertz myth. And to explain the megahertz myth for us, I've asked John Rubenstein, our Senior Vice President of Hardware at Apple, to come up and give us a brief tutorial on the megahertz myth. John? Thank you. All yours. Thank you, Steve. Morning, everybody. OK, so you just saw the G4 beat the Pentium 4. And some of you are thinking to yourselves, wait a minute. 1.8 gigahertz, that's twice as fast as 867 megahertz. And those of you that are thinking this are suffering from belief in the megahertz myth. And that is that megahertz equals performance. But megahertz does not equal performance. It's just a contributing factor to performance. Now to understand this, we have to look at how processors are designed. There's a lot of complicated trade-offs in processor design. And I've picked four of the key architectural trade-offs for us to look at. Of course, there's frequency. We want to run as fast as possible. The frequency will be based on what process we're in and the number of pipeline stages. The more pipeline stages we have, the less work we do every cycle. And so the faster the, the pipeline can run. These two are very much related. 
and there's some real downsides to having long pipelines. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Then there's a the number of functional units. The more functional units you have, the more parallelism you can have. That's how many instructions you can execute every cycle. And the cache design. Whether you have a level one, or the size of the level one, the size of the level two, and if you have one, the level three cache. So all of these factors play into what the performance of the processor, not just frequency. So let's look at some examples of this. Here are the four leading processors in the industry today. The PowerPC G4, my personal favorite. The Pentium 4. Intel's next generation 64-bit architecture, the Itanium. And Sun's latest Spark processor, the UltraSpark 3. We can compare several characteristics of these processors. We can look at the process, the size, the number of pipeline stages, and how many megahertz they run at. Now, it's interesting. Most people would assume that because the Pentium 4 runs at 1.8 gigahertz, that it would be in a much faster process. But the reality is, is all four of these processors are in the same process, give or take. And it's interesting to note that the G4 is a very efficient design, because it's half the size of the other processors. Now let's look at, at how Intel got to 1.8 gigahertz. They did that to go into 20 pipeline stages. Now we see that the G4 is only seven pipeline stages. So you're thinking, well, what's a pipeline stage? So all processors execute instructions through their pipeline. This is a very simplified version of it. It's a four-stage pipeline. Instruction gets fetched, decoded, executes, and the results stored. Now all the processors we're looking at have more pipeline stages than this. And they have one or more of these pipeline stages broken down into multiple pipeline stages. Let's look at an example of this. We have the seven-stage G4 versus the 20-stage Pentium 4 here. And we're going to execute equivalent instruction streams down these pipelines. So we see instructions flowing down the pipeline. And the short pipeline starts getting results sooner. It takes us a while to fill the longer pipeline. Now we start seeing some results coming off the long pipeline. So right off the bat, the long pipeline has a disadvantage in that it takes longer time to fill. Now every cycle, we're executing one instruction and completing, and completing it. So you're probably thinking, well, wait a minute. The longer pipeline is running twice as fast as the shorter pipeline. And so at some point in time, it's going to catch up to the short pipeline and pass it. And that would be true in the ideal case. But it's not a perfect world. And there's inefficiencies associated with long pipelines. That's been called in the press lately the pipeline tax. And the pipeline tax is be it occurs because there are bubbles in the pipeline that come from data dependencies. That's where one instruction is dependent on the data from a previous instruction. Or even more catastrophic is certain branches can cause the entire pipeline to drain. So let's take a look at this again. Now again, we're going to run the same instruction stream down both of these pipelines. We start, we see that the short instruction pipeline starts generating results first, and you start to see some bubbles. So we see bubbles. Now bubbles can be one to many clock cycles. Now we see a branch. That's the red instruction. You notice the pipeline drains. Now the, the instruction, the instructions get to the end of the long pipeline, and that one drains. So we see that whenever we hit one of these kind of branches, we pay an enormous penalty for having that long pipeline. Now the short pipeline drains. We see a variety of bubbles, more branches. And we see that the longer pipeline falls farther and farther behind the short pipeline. OK, there's the last branch on the short pipeline. Finish that last instruction. Continue executing along. There's the final branch for the long pipeline. Now, these branches, data dependencies, occur very often. Right? And it really depends on what your code looks like. OK, now we'll finish up that last instruction. And we're done on the long pipeline. So let's go back and compare our four processors again. OK, we have the Pentium 4 running at 1.8 gigahertz and those 20 pipeline stages. It's interesting to look at the Itanium, because again, Intel's next generation processor 
they chose to go with 10 pipeline stages. Note that it runs at 800 megahertz. And we see the UltraSpark 3 has 14 pipeline stages and runs at 900 megahertz. So the G4 is an extremely efficient design in that it only has seven pipeline stages and yet runs at the same speed as other processors that have much longer pipelines. So I hope that this gets you to understand that performance is more than just megahertz. And I hope you're not fooled by the megahertz myth. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, John. So, again, the megahertz myth. An 867 megahertz G4 can be as fast or even faster than a 1.7 gigahertz Pentium 4, and it gets even better when you add two G4s in the multiprocessor model. So these things are very, very fast. Let's talk about availability. Got three models. The 733 and the 867 are available starting today. The multiprocessor model will be available starting next month. We also have three great displays to go with them. They're fantastic for Mac OS X. They all are active matrix LCD. They are all digitally driven from the computer, so you get the most precise, crisp images. They all have a built-in USB hub, so you get two USB ports right on the display, and they are all powered from the computer, so you don't need these power bricks lying around. And all of that is over one cable, the power, the USB, and the digital signaling. So three displays. We have a 22-inch cinema display, the finest flat display in the industry by far. Our new 17-inch display, 1280 by 1024, and our 15-inch display, 10 by 7, and three aggressive prices. We've lowered the price on the cinema display down to $24.99. Our 17-inch is under $1,000, and $599 for our 15-inch. So these are very, very high-quality, very affordable displays that are designed to go perfectly with the Power Mac G4. So I've made a video now uh, that I'd love to show you about our new Power Mac lineup. So let's roll the video. From science to the arts and everywhere in between. People are opening up new worlds with the Power Mac G4. I feel like one of the apes in 2001. It's the monolith. The new Power Mac G4 is going to revolutionize our business. It's not going to change it. It's going to revolutionize it. This is a significant development. This is going to be a really huge breakthrough for a huge industry. Now there's a new Power Mac G4 a super high-performance personal computer with the power to create, the power to burn, the power to perform like never before. It's just amazingly fast. <laughs> I think that's incredible. I think the speed, it, that kind of boost is phenomenal. We're still reeling from the 733, so I walk in there and it's like, okay, the 733 is now our admin machine. <laughs> it's amazing. Apple SuperDrive has added an exciting new dimension to the G4 line. Complex tasks that used to take whole groups of people can now be done with one person on one machine, the new Power Mac G4. Now I'm so excited because I'm talking with some of our artists about making their own videos. Apple is giving them the power, is actually giving them the power to follow through with their artistic vision, which is after all the reason that we signed them and they can fulfill it. Apple's making that possible for them, and it's the greatest thing in the world. The new Power Mac G4 lineup is screaming fast. It starts with a 733 megahertz G4 chip, where you can step right up to 867 megahertz with a two megabyte L3 cache, the fastest chip we've ever shipped. At the high end, there's the new bad dog, the dual 800 megahertz G4 the fastest map we've ever made. The modern foundation under Mac OS X takes full advantage of the dual processors, boosting productivity even further with symmetric multiprocessing. The new 867 megahertz system 
runs Photoshop 50% faster than the latest 1.7 gigahertz Intel system. And with Dual 800s, we are running over 80% faster. That's speed you can see, speed you can use. There are four PCI slots for expansion, an NVIDIA card standard across the line. The new PowerMac G4 and our family of all digital displays are opening a whole new world of possibilities. There are six billion bases in the human genome. That corresponds to an information content of 750 megabytes. The data are immense. And in order to think about them, we have to be able to manipulate them. And in order to manipulate 750 megabyte chunks of information, you need very big and fast computers. And for that reason, the G4 caught our attention because it represents another iteration of revolutionary change uh, from the server to the desktop. When you take something like the G4 and you put dual processors running at 800, that's like twin turbos in our business. J. Walter Thompson is it's an idea engine, and the Apple uh, Power Mac G4s with their super drives allow us to, to burn DVDs. And when you're able to burn DVDs real time, that's one less thing you have to wait for. And the less waiting time, the more time you have to uh, be creative. I've never found an artist who has a problem when I talk to them about Macintosh. They always understand. Digital recording tools, you go to Apple, that's it. CD mastering solutions, Apple. Album graphics, Apple. I don't, I've never met anyone who uses anything but Apple. Everyone in this company does, it's all about Apple. Hallmark isn't just about greeting cards anymore. You see tools like IDVD being priceless in that any 